enthusiasts, welcome to another episode of our ongoing series where we dive deep into the core concepts of cable technology. I'm Brady Volp, founder of the Volp Firm and Chief Product Officer of Open Vault, and your guide on this journey. And today we have a particularly exciting topic. What is RF? As always, I'm joined by the incomparable Ron Rannick, a true master in the field, our beacon through the sometimes murky waters of technical jargon and complex concepts. Today we're taking a step back to revisit the fundamentals with our back to basics approach. We'll start with some basic definitions and move through the foundational elements of RF, including sine waves, wavelengths, and the crucial domains of time and frequency. But that's not all. We'll also delve into the essence of electromagnetic radiation, the mesmerizing speed of light, and the practical tools of the trade like spectrum analyzers and techniques for measuring RF. This episode is perfect for both the curious newcomer and the seasoned professional looking to refresh their knowledge. So grab your notepads and let's unravel the mysteries of RF together. Ron, always a pleasure to have you. What excites you most about today's topic? RF excites me most about today's topic. <laughs> and uh, happy Friday. Thanks for having me uh, be part of the series again. <coughs> Excuse me, a little bit left over lunch there. Um, I've been involved in the RF side of the cable industry for the last five decades. And to me, it's um, it's a branch of of our business that really is the foundation of almost everything we do. Our cable networks are based upon um, the transmission of RF through those networks. Of course, we, we have fiber now, and maybe from one perspective, you could say that the light going through the fibers is really, 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 really high frequency RF. I'll touch on that a little bit later on. Um, but I like RF. I've been a ham radio operator for uh, almost 50 years. And of course, that's all RF. Or, well, mostly RF. So um, RF uh, has found its way into my hobbies and, of course, into uh, what I did for 50 plus years in the cable industry. So yeah, so I, I think that's, um, you know, talking about ham radio, I, we've talked about that in um, pre, well, before we get in, into episodes before. And I, I think, um, you know, maybe at some point we'll we'll get to do an episode on ham radio, but I think that's something that is really intriguing for people to maybe do on the side as a hobby because it lets them explore RF sort of on the hobby, learn a little bit more about it. And I think you've done a lot in the ham radio um, side of your own personal life. And that, that really, I think, is for anyone in the industry something that just lets them learn a little bit more about the industry itself. W would, would you agree with that? Well, I would I would go a little bit further. I would say that that uh, the hobby of ham radio, of course, is is one where you can learn as little or as much as you want about technology and and RF. But I've found um, over the years that having ham radio for a hobby has has um, blended very very nicely with with my uh, career in cable. Um, a lot of what I do or did in cable applies to ham radio and i'm talking about rf stuff and then a lot of the rf stuff that i've learned in ham radio applies to cable so they they complement each other actually quite nicely yeah so so that is on my list of things to do is to get my ham radio license i know we also have some other friends that have that on our list so we're going to keep pushing <laughs> that out maybe we'll get some more folks in the industry to get on ham radio so without further ado let's get started on our rf journey um, folks be sure to drop your questions in the chat and hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already so ron let's get started all right and with any luck um my first slide is showing up, and of Indeed course, it, it is. There's the question: What is RF? And and um, I'll answer this from a, a few perspectives. But I need to point out that because of the uh, limited amount of time we have to do these sessions, um, the material I'm talking about today is intentionally very, very high level. Um, for those of you who have studied um, RF engineering in in school, you know that it can get into some really deep, deep stuff. And Brady, I know you studied very deep, very in school a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And, um, you know, and, and they're just, there's so many facets of, of the world of RF that could be covered. And we could, we could spend the next two or three years doing a, a session <laughs> a month or every couple of weeks and still not cover it all. So I'll answer the question pretty easily. What is RF? 
Well, let's start with the abbreviation. It's radio frequency. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you for just joining. a couple. Just a couple. <laughs> okay, couldn't resist, couldn't resist that one. So let's look at some um, uh, some definitions that uh, put a bit more serious uh, twist on this. So radio frequency um, can be thought of as as that part of the electromagnetic spectrum um, ranging in frequency from a few kilohertz to just below the frequency of infrared light up to about 300 gigahertz. And that's a pretty wide range. And we can also um, define radio frequency as the rate of oscillation within that frequency range, roughly three kilohertz to 300 gigahertz. And I'm gonna talk about rate of oscillation a, a little bit later on. However, before too much eyeball glaze factor um, sets in, I think uh, it, it would be helpful to to get back to some of the basic concepts, such as frequency and wavelength and the electromagnetic spectrum and, and some other things. But I want to start with something that's not even part of the electromagnetic spectrum, because some people might be a little confused about this, particularly as I start uh, discussing the concept of alternating current. So let's start with direct current or DC. Um, this is an electric current that is what's called unidirectional. And it's, it's uh, because of a voltage source um, whose output maintains the same polarity. And a good example is a flashlight battery. So I have, have an example graphic over here on the right side. So maybe that's a C size or D size flashlight battery. But it's important to understand direct current or DC is not RF and it is not part of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. That said, there are some concepts related to direct current that I'm not gonna talk about today that can serve as the foundation for getting a better understanding of, of some of the other pieces and parts of the world that we call RF, which leads me to AC or alternating current. And uh, of course, we, we, we hear the term AC and we tend to think of um, that wall plug or that wall socket th where we plug in a lamp or something else in our house. Um, but it's a lot more than that. It's an electric current that periodically reverses direction and whose instantaneous magnitude varies continuously over time. Now that's important to understand and I'll explain why in just a little bit. Uh, but an example includes the uh, previously mentioned um, AC that we can get from that, uh, that wall outlet. That falls into a chunk of the spectrum called super low frequency, believe it or not, or SLF. And uh, that's the household electrical outlet. But notice the last part of that sentence on the slide here. AC also includes RF signals. And you might go, wait a minute. That's wait a really minute. interesting. Was, well, yeah, it's, yeah. RF signals are a form of alternating current. Um, however, um, it's important to understand that, that the AC that we plug that lamp into in the wall out, outlet is typically not considered a form of RF. However, it is possible to have an RF signal whose frequency is within that range. Now, just a moment ago, I said that RF generally is assumed to be, uh, to have a frequency from a few kilohertz up to about 300 gigahertz. But important to understand that both the US and Russia have used SLF, super low frequency signals, in the 76 hertz to 82 hertz range for communication with submarines. Um, that's an interesting topic in itself. Um, and the, uh, there are reasons why they use those really, really low frequencies or have used them. But as you might imagine, um, trying to communicate on those very low frequencies is difficult. Um, and it requires extremely low data rates with some pretty robust forward air correction. But the military has done it. Um, and you can imagine what the, what the antennas would be like. Um, really long antennas, they, right? Oh, yeah. Extremely they, long. And it's because these, these SLF, and then there's also a little higher frequency called ELF, extra low frequencies, and it's because they penetrate the water. That That's the, the main Well, and they the also propagate easily around the earth. Yeah. They, they don't zip off Very out into the Very long direction. They, they, <laughs> stick, they stick to the ground, which is pretty cool. Very cool. So, I did not, and I did not know that about uh, AC even being considered that. So that's I didn't, and I also did not know about SLF frequencies. I knew about the ELFs, but not the SLFs. Well, you'll see it on a, on a graphic that I've got coming up here in just a little bit. Now, somebody might ask a question, well, what about sound waves? Are they part of, uh, are, they, are they RF? And the answer is no. Um, sound waves, by definition, are, are vibrations um, in, in the air or maybe in the water or, or some solid object. But basically, it's, it's compression waves. 
through some kind of a medium that we can hear in uh, the roughly 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. They're frequency. not electric. They're acoustic. They're not electric. No, they're not electric. If you're right. out in space, no one can hear you scream. Remember that? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that from the movie Alien. Um, and the reason, of course, is there's nothing to convey um, those the, uh, the sound waves. There's nothing there because it's a vacuum. So um, sound waves are not RF and they're not part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But, and this is where things can get a little confusing, sound waves can have the same frequency as some radio waves. Yeah, they go up to and, 20 kilohertz or even well, higher that you can't hear them. Kilohertz. And I've, I've, got a, I've got an example here. So most people can hear a five kilohertz audio tone. It's fairly high yeah. pitched, but most people can hear it. But nobody can hear a five kilohertz RF signal. Right. And the military has used frequencies in that five kilohertz, give or take range, also for communication with submarines. There used to be some, used to be a station, I think in Virginia on the coast, and there was another one up by the Great Lakes somewhere that was used for communication with submarines, somewhere in that five kilohertz to eight kilohertz range. But those were electromagnetic signals. They were not sound waves, even though right. they were on the same. They both have the same frequency. Our, our ear can process acoustic signals, but our ear cannot process electrical signals. So that's, that's why, why we can't hear them. That's, that's absolutely correct, because they aren't the same thing. They, they may have the same frequency, but they're not the same thing. All right, so talking about frequency, what the heck is it? Well, it's, it's the number of times, typically per second, that a repetitive event happens. Now, that's kind of a generic description because frequency can apply to a lot of different things. It's independent so, of RF or even sound yeah. or or even yeah. the frequency that we may go someplace in a given I, mean, time I can sit day. here and I can sit here and wave my hand back and forth a few times per second and we can assign a frequency to that or maybe you know maybe one time per second. So it's um, one one hertz. So that the wave of my hand has a frequency but it has nothing to do with RF right. or sound or anything else. Uh, but it's just we're just saying here that frequency is that number of times that that a repetitive event happens. And the vast majority of the time when we describe uh, the frequency of something is typically the number of times that that repetitive event happens, usually per second. And that is called a rate of oscillation. That's that's that term I mentioned just a little bit ago. Yeah. Now, let's go back to the example of, of uh, alternating current from a a household electrical outlet that's on the wall. And I'll talk about a North American one here. Um, the polarity of that alternating current waveform that is in our wall outlet changes through a complete uh, um, cycle of values 60 times each second. So the frequency then is 60 cycles per second. So imagine me waving my hand. Of course, I can't wave it that fast, but 60 times per second, that would be a frequency of 60 cycles, or in the case of my hand, waves per second. Now, those changes are, aren't instantaneous, but they actually vary continuously, but quickly from one value to another. So for RF signals, that number of cycles per second can vary typically from a few thousand times per second. So we would say that's in the kilohertz frequency range. Um, to billions of times per second, or in the gigahertz frequency range, and even higher. Um, of course, there are exceptions. As I mentioned earlier, the, the submarine communications can occur on really, 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 really low frequencies down in the tens of hertz, or perhaps the perhaps a few kilohertz range. But um, that's that's RF signals. Right. So if you wave, waved your hand um, at 60 cycles per second, that's going to give you an elbow hertz, right? Oh, it's going to give me a big time. <laughs> <laughs> and that is so bad. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I'm trying to make up for, you know, one of our colleagues that always oh, has well, bad jokes. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. Jason. Yes. yes. Dr. Dad joke. Yes. Um, yes. Well, let's continue the discussion about frequency because it's such an important parameter that is part of the world of RF. Now, the variation that we call frequency <clears throat> can be measured in terms of parameters such as amplitude and degrees. Or at least that's that's part of it. So as an example, if we consider a full cycle of um, polarity change, we would say that comprises 360 degrees. And if that cycle is completed in, in one second, then the frequency would be one cycle per second or one hertz. And this, the other pieces here, amplitude and degrees, will make a little bit more sense when I show you a picture of a sine wave in the time domain coming up. So if we think about the the AC uh, from the wall outlet in the living room or the bedroom or wherever, 
the frequency of that is 60 cycles per second or 60 hertz. And if you go to Europe, it's 50 cycles per second or 50 hertz. So that's why I mentioned North America, because we we're, we live in the world of 60 hertz alternating current for our, our um, electricity supply. But looking at in the world of RF, if you've got a favorite FM radio station you like to listen to in your car or maybe on the stereo setup in your home, FM uh, stations transmitted uh, radio signal might have a frequency of 103,500,000 hertz or 103.5 megahertz. And we abbreviate megahertz MHZ. Now, note, note the way these, these abbreviations are, spell, are, are listed compared to the spelled out definition of it. In the case of hertz, um, up there in red, you'll notice that the word hertz is lowercase. The only time you use uppercase with hertz is if you're talking about Heinrich Hertz. Uh, that's the person after whom the unit of frequency is named. But when you're talking about units of frequency, it's with a lowercase h. However, what the National Institute of Standards and Technology and the International System of Units calls a symbol, we would call it abbreviation, the abbreviation for hertz is an uppercase h and a lowercase z. Now we look down at megahertz, you can spell it out. It's all lowercase. No, mega does not get a capital M when you spell out the word. It is lowercase. So megahertz, the way I have it written there, but the abbreviation is uppercase M, uppercase H, and lowercase Z. And there are some important reasons why you do that, and it has to do with all the variations um, that can be applied to frequency, and all that comes from the international system of units. And we want to keep things standardized so that we don't get confused. And you don't have any idea why we don't um, uppercase the H in megahertz in, because the, it is the person's last name. You... But in the case of frequency units, it's not. Yeah, okay. It is It is named after Heinrich Hertz, but the unit of frequency itself spelled out as a word has a lowercase h. Sounds that's good. The, that's the way <laughs> it is. just the way it is. <laughs> yep. Um, but it's that's spelled out in the international system of units, and that's an international standard, and it really defines um, really defines all this and the proper usage of all these abbreviations and so on. So let's talk about um, these units of frequency that we call hertz. I said it's you know cycle per second equals hertz, or they're measured in hertz. In fact, in, in years past, before the the uh, the word hertz was adopted to reference um, units of frequency. They actually used cycles per second. So there were kilocycles per second or megacycles per second or cycles per second. And then at some point, the decision was made to honor Heinrich Hertz and name uh, the unit of frequency that. after him. Yeah. Uh, but when it's, as I said, when you're referencing the unit of frequency, it's a lowercase h. So one cycle per second is one hertz. Um, a thousand cycles per second would be a thousand hertz or one kilohertz. A million cycles per second would be a million hertz or one megahertz, a billion with a B cycles per second would be one billion hertz or one gigahertz, or in some places, giga is pronounced with a J sound, so gigahertz. Um, depends on the country where you go, but I've heard it both ways. And if you're talking about really, really high frequency, one terahertz um, is one trillion cycles per second or a trillion hertz. And the numbers keep going after after Terra. I didn't. I just stopped there because that's typically where we stop with uh, when we're talking about RF um, and when we get into the frequencies of light. Now let's let's talk about an electromagnetic signal. And that's our, our RF signals. Can be they can be represented in the time domain and the frequency domain as a sine wave. But when you look at these the these two. Um, representations of a sine wave in the time or frequency domain, they look quite different, even though they're technically the same thing. And I'll, I'll show you a pretty good example of what the two look like here just a little bit later on. So let's start first by plotting a sinusoidal AC waveform on a graph of amplitude in the vertical axis and um, time in the horizontal axis. And we get the classic sine wave. Um, and that that sinusoidal a the AC waveform can be the alternating current from the wall, the electrical wall outlet. It can be an RF signal. It can even be light. Um, but the point is, it's an it's a sinusoidal AC waveform. Now that leads us then to some things, some clever things we can do when we understand this wave-like nature of alternating current, including RF. So one way to characterize it is by its wavelength. Now, there are a couple ways we can describe wavelength. One is it's a measure of distance between two 
the same points on adjacent cycles. So if you plot a sine wave, and I'll show you an example here in a moment, um, the distance between one peak and the other peak and, or adjacent peak could be the wavelength. Now, we typically wouldn't consider that distance on, say, a device like an oscilloscope, but if we're thinking of, of electromagnetic waves propagating through the atmosphere, um, if we could somehow measure those with a tape measure, then we could say that's the, the wavelength. Now, another definition of wavelength is the distance that a wave travels through some medium in the period of a single cycle. And that could be very applicable to a transmission media, a medium such as coaxial cable. Uh, because of the velocity of propagation of the cable, the wavelength in the cable is going to be different than it is in a vacuum. So if getting back to the period of a single cycle, that's equal to one divided by the frequency in hertz or the, the reciprocal of the frequency in hertz. And that gives us the period in seconds. So basically they're saying wavelength and frequency are are kind of reciprocals of each other. Oh, they're, they're very closely related. Yes. Um, interestingly, we, we were talking about ham radio just a little bit ago. Um, way, 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 way back in the very early days of radio communications, um, instead of frequency, wavelength was used to describe those those signals. So it was not unusual to talk about 200 meters wavelength and down or 200 meters uh, wavelength and up. Uh, ham operators still, to this day, describe um, a lot of their their uh, communications bands by wavelength. So for example, the 80 meter uh, ham band is 3.5 megahertz to 4.0 megahertz. So they're very closely related. So here's a screenshot of a sine wave in the time domain. And this is from an instrument called an oscilloscope. And as you look at this, you can see that the vertical axis is amplitude. And you can look at the peak amplitude, the peak to peak amplitude. Um, you can see one cycle on here. And you'll note that the horizontal axis is time. That horizontal axis can also be um, in degrees. And that gets us into the world of phase, <clears throat> which I'm not really going to talk about today. That's, that's, that's another, another topic on itself. That's another topic. <laughs> but if we, uh, hopefully my cursor is showing up. Yes, it if is. We, if we look at just one cycle, that one cycle would equal 360 degrees. And if we get into playing around with vectors and things and rotating vectors, which is another fun part when we start talking about phase, then um, that rotating vector forms one, one complete circle of 360 degrees. And if you plot that out sinusoidally like this, you get this 360 degrees in one cycle, but topic for another time. Anyway, so this is the sine wave in the time domain. So now let's take a look at it um, showing basically the same signal, but um, looked at from two different perspectives. A, a, test, a piece of test equipment called an oscilloscope, and there's a, a screenshot of one down here on the left, shows a sine wave signal in the time domain. That's what oscilloscopes display, is, is signals in the time domain. The vertical axis is amplitude, and the horizontal axis is time. So here we see the classic sine wave on an oscilloscope. But most of us are probably from, more familiar with spectrum analyzers. Frequency um, and domain, these are absolutely. Yeah, these, these things display signals in the frequency domain. So here, amplitude is still in the vertical axis like it is on the oscilloscope, but the horizontal axis is frequency. So if you look at this, you can see a sine wave on a spectrum analyzer, and you see, well, it's just a spike sticking up above the noise. And it's the exact same thing as what you see on the left. It's just another way to look at it. So Probably one of, these, one of the most difficult things I had uh, my, that I was able to get my head around when I was learning this in college and probably you know when I talk to people about RF this is this is really tough to get your head around understanding this relationship between the time domain on the left and the frequency domain on the right that we're looking at the same thing yeah so I don't know if you yeah. have any like uh, any suggestions on to Ron for people that how how you can really <laughs> understand these other than well What's on the I'm, left is the same as what's on the right. One just time domain representation and one is frequency domain representation. I've, I've uh, been fortunate to have played with both types of instruments, oscilloscopes. In fact, I've got um, an oscilloscope in my ham radio gear here. It's a, it's a little, digital, yeah. little digital one um, that, that shows time domain. Um, what I've done, though, in, in the past with, with high bandwidth oscilloscopes, and yes, oscilloscopes can have bandwidth, so they can display higher and higher frequency signals, but in the time domain. I have looked at RF signals in the time domain on an oscilloscope. For example, a 64-qualm signal uh, 
uh, that looks like a haystack on a spectrum analyzer looks rather interesting in the time domain on an oscilloscope. And you, know, you can hook a two-way splitter up and connect one output to the spectrum analyzer and the other output to the uh, the input of, a, of an oscilloscope and see the same signal at the same time in two different uh, domains. One is time domain and one is frequency domain. Now there's a, I didn't put it in this slide deck, but there's a graphic that's been around for a long time. I And I've seen different companies use variations of it, but a good way to think of, um, to think of the sine wave in the time domain is kind of the sideways view of the frequency domain. So if you could visualize um, turning that that sine wave that's on the left side, turn it around 90 degrees to face you, then you're looking at it edge on. Now, this isn't really what happens, but it helps to get your head around it. Then you've got now a display of of uh, this, this spike sticking up out of the noise floor. Um, I wish I had that that graphic because it, it really puts it into perspective. And then you can say, oh, okay, I can see where you can have time domain and frequency domain in this in this graphic to really help differentiate it. But if you get a chance to look at the same signal on uh, two different instruments, or even at, at the same time like this, I think that helps put it into perspective. And yes, in in uh, when you study engineering, you get into the world of, of Fourier transform where you can mathematically change between um, the time domain and the frequency domain. But frankly, I think it's easier just to yeah. look, at, look at one on an oscilloscope and one on a spectrum analyzer. You don't have to worry about the math. Yeah, say, it, this is what it is. And another thing I was going to suggest for people is um, if you're, you know, if you're interested in playing with these RF signals and trying to understand them a little better, um, for not very much money, they make these little RTL, SDR, software-defined radios. And you can buy these on Amazon for, I think, like $30 or so. USB stick, USB on one side, it goes right into your computer, and an RF connector on the other, and it comes with a coax cable and an antenna, um, so and, and then software, so you can you can visualize RF signals in both the time domain and the frequency domain right on your computer that comes right off the air. So that might be another way um, that yeah. people can visualize RF right in their own homes on their own computers without spending a lot of money on very expensive spectrum analyzers and oscilloscopes. And, and speaking of these things you can order offline uh, or order online, I think there's um, some little low-cost spectrum analyzers available yep. that are they're not, not very big. They're, what, three by five inches or maybe smaller than that. Um, so you can get low-cost spectrum analyzers for, what, 60 bucks or something. Yeah. And there's, a, there's another one called Nano VNA that is um, – a vector network analyzer and it's 60 to 90 bucks yeah we and, have some videos but, of those on on the volt firm uh, on, on our youtube channel using the nano vna as well so people can search on that and, and see and how those they're work they're cool. awesome they're, they're op absolutely yeah. awesome for very cheap they're, cheap. they're really cheap yes it's, it's not going to give you the same performance as a sixty thousand dollar vna yeah. but but they're sure fun to have around the the ham shack if you're a ham operator yes. or if you're a hobbyist uh, just to play with absolutely all right, let's get back to some definitions. Um, NASA, interestingly, defines the electromagnetic spectrum. And here's how they, they say, uh, or here's what they say. The full range of frequencies from radio waves to gamma waves. Gamma, gamma wave, gamma rays. I'll, I'll be all right here. Wikipedia says it's the full range of, or it's the range of all possible frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. So now we've got two terms here. Electromagnetic spectrum, and I'm going to show a graphic of that here pretty quick. And electromagnetic radiation. Let's talk about electromagnetic radiation. Now, here's a graphic um, that illustrates what electromagnetic radiation looks like or could look like, maybe. It's a bit more complex than this, but this, this helps to um, get the concept across. So electromagnetic radiation is a form of energy that's uh, composed of oscillating electric fields and magnetic fields. Now, this is important to understand. We think of electromagnetic waves and we just think, well, it's just a wave, just a radio wave. Well, it's actually got an electric component and a magnetic component. They are orthogonal to each other or perpendicular to each other. And they're also orthogonal or perpendicular to the direction of travel or propagation. Um, now, the, the uh, electromagnetic radiation has wave-like behavior as it zips along at the speed of light. So take a look at this graphic here and you can see um, you can see in the, the, the vertical axis on this graphic is the magnetic um, component or the magnetic field component of an electromagnetic wave. And the green or horizontal piece here is the electric field 
component of an electromagnetic wave. And we call it electromagnetic because it has an electric component and a magnetic component. So that's why the, the term electromagnetic is used. So let's talk briefly about the speed of light. Um, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, I mentioned them earlier, um, does have the definition for the speed of light, and it is exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. That is the speed of light in a vacuum. So if we apply the calculator to that number, we can get some other uh, units out of that for the speed of light in a vacuum. In feet per second, it's 983,571,056 and change feet per second. Now, we were always taught that the speed of light is you know, 186,000 miles per second. I want to be a bit more accurate than that. It's actually 186,282.397 miles per second. Um, and then in miles per hour, which may be more familiar to some people, uh, the speed of light in a vacuum is 670 million. 616,629 and change. That's going to be a big speeding ticket to get that. Oh, it's it's incredibly <laughs> fast. Um, to put it in perspective um, and look at it a couple different ways, if we think of um, the speed of light in a vacuum in, in, in being about 983 million feet per second, um, what is how far does light or or an electromagnetic wave travel in one foot? How long does it take to go a foot? It's about a billionth of a yeah. second. Now, looking at it another way, if you could shoot a beam of light around the Earth, say around the equator, and it, you know, there weren't any mountains or any obstructions in the way, and it didn't want to stay in a straight line and go off out into space, but hug the equator and went around the Earth, how many times would that beam of light travel around the Earth in one second? Well, I would, I would guess it's going to be many times it's going to go around in one second. Well, it's it's a it's a little over seven times in yeah. one second. So it's, it's it takes eight what six minutes or eight minutes to for the light to get to the Earth from the sun. From, uh, yeah, it's from little, the sun. Yeah. Over, it's a little over eight minutes for yeah. the light from the sun to reach the Earth. So we can. Uh, it's moving. It, and that's that's ninety three roughly ninety three million yeah, miles away. So yeah, it's zipping it's zipping along at a pretty good clip. All right, let's. Take a closer look now at electromagnetic signals. And remember, RF is part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now so we we'll can get your question in just a moment. It's just coming you got up. got a question? Yeah, what's well, about resolution bandwidth? And I think we'll cover that when we get to the spectrum analyzer. Well, I don't I don't have a discussion on it, but ask the question. I can go ahead and answer says, it. Now. Melvin says, I think resolution bandwidth, or RBW, is also important when you buy an analyzer. Yes, he's right. It's very important to be able to control that. The, the way to think of our resolution bandwidth in a spectrum analyzer is, is it's the bandwidth of the intermediate frequency stages of the analyzer. And when you look on a, on a spectrum analyzer at a CW carrier, um, that CW carrier really doesn't have any bandwidth. It's, it would, should look just like a straight vertical line. It doesn't, though. It kind of goes up a little bit and then kind of comes back down. What we're actually seeing is the shape of the RBW filter yeah. when you see that on the display. And that RBW filter controls like how how small of signals we can see. Well, how closely sp Correct. spaced they are. If, if you've yeah. got two carriers that are really close together, um, you need to have a small enough resolution bandwidth that the analyzer can display both of them. Otherwise, if you use a wide resolution bandwidth, you're not gonna you're not gonna see the two signals. You'll just see a see one hump on the display. So yes, it's very important. Um, the good lab grade spectrum analyzers typically have a pretty wide selection of resolution bandwidths from from perhaps a few megahertz down to um, a few hertz yeah. and 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 that's that's all they all have their use depending on what you're trying to measure but yes they are extremely important thanks for the question right. melvin that's a, yeah that's a good question electromagnetic signals as i've talked about earlier can be visualized as waves and the analogy i love to use is to imagine a pond with a stick stuck in the mud and the stick sticking up out of the water. And you toss a rock into the pond, and that, of course that generates ripples. Um, and those ripples go by a, that stick sticking up out of the water. And we see some number of ripples passing by that stick uh, per second. And you know the ripples have, have a certain height or amplitude. And so we can talk about frequency and, and, and uh, wavelength and amplitude from that analogy, I'll show you a picture. 
in a minute. So let's recap some of the definitions we've talked about and add one new one. So frequency, remember, is, is the number of times typically per second that a repetitive event happens or the rate of oscillation of electromagnetic signal. And we measure frequency in units of hertz, abbreviated HZ with an uppercase H and a lowercase Z. And that's the number of cycles or waves per second. Wavelength is a measure of the distance between the same points on adjacent cycles. For example, from one cycle's peak to an adjacent cycle's peak. Amplitude is the signal level, or more specifically, the power of the electromagnetic signal. And the new one here, bandwidth. If, you're, if you work in the data world, you will probably have a different definition for bandwidth. Bits per second. Bits per second. And I'm an RF guy, so you guys stole that from us. You stole the word <laughs> bandwidth from us, thieves anyway. So bandwidth in the world of RF is the amount or width of the spectrum measured in units of hertz that an electromagnetic signal occupies. So let's go back to my analogy with the pond and the stick sticking up. I couldn't find a decent stick uh, example, so I just put a vertical brown line on there. So throw a rock in the water, count the number of waves per second that go by that wooden post. That's the frequency. Now, then, and you have to be standing there next to it, I suppose, measure the distance between adjacent peaks or adjacent valleys. That's the wavelength. And then finally, measure the height of those waves or ripples. That's the amplitude. So that's the analogy. Now, understand that we see these ripples on the surface of the water, but they're actually propagating under the water too. And that's probably more realistic. That's more three-dimensional in nature. These are the, the ripples on top of the water. I mean, it's, yeah, they're three-dimensional, but they're almost more like a, a, a two-dimensional perspective. But if you could visualize those ripples propagating through the water, and that gets a little hard to get your head around is trying to visualize that. Yeah. That same concept applies to electromagnetic waves propagating through the air, like light or radio waves, except now throw in the fact that, that there's an electric component to that and a, and a magnetic component, that, and they're orthogonal to each other. So now it gets really, really difficult to try to visualize what's going on with those waves zipping along through the air. Yeah, Jazzcat102, welcome back. He says, bandwidth, bandwidth has multiple meanings for me. And, and I think, you know, to your point, Ron, with like people on the data side, saying it's in bits per second, an hour megahertz. So I, I think that's going to be true for a lot of people, that bandwidth in our industry, and, and probably many industries, has multiple right. meanings, depending on how you interpret it. And when I talk about RF, I'm talking about bandwidth, like you see here on the on the spectrum analyzer. The width of the channel. The width of the signal. Um, and in this case, we see three different parameters displayed here. Amplitude is in the vertical axis. Frequencies in the horizontal axis, and no, the bandwidth in this case is the is the width in, in this example of a six megahertz wide um, single carrier QAM signal. Um, bandwidth could also describe a measurement bandwidth. Maybe there's no signal there, but we say we're we're going to measure something within a bandwidth. But here we're talking about the amount of um, spectrum that something could take up or does take up, but in, usually measured in units of hertz. So, if I were teaching an RF course. And talking about bandwidth, if you put down bits per second, you would get a big red check mark. <laughs> <laughs> go to the data class in the classroom next door. You're you good to go. In there all day long. Anyway, I got to I got to dish out some good natured grief. All right. So continuing on this this thread of discussion that electromagnetic radiation has wave like behavior, we can categorize. Um, electromagnetic radiation based on its wavelength. And we've talked about wavelength a little bit. But if we if we think about um, electromagnetic radiation and its longest wavelengths, those would be the lowest frequency. So long wavelength equals low frequency. And then we go to the shortest wavelengths or the highest frequency. So short, shorter wavelengths equals higher frequencies, longer wavelengths equals lower frequencies. And then the list in the electromagnetic spectrum would look like this. They would be radio waves, microwaves, infrared light, visible light, ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays um, across the spectrum, and then all kinds of different things going on in those different ranges. So here's a graphic at the bottom. It's, it's a sine wave-like signal. So you can see long wavelength equals low frequency, and short wavelength equals high frequency. And this is probably a good way that you can start, you know, if, if you're struggling to think about what that relationship is between the frequency domain and the time domain, this may be, this is actually, I think, a good image, Ron, to, to start to visualize that so that 
that um, long wavelength as you're talking about in that slide that translates to high frequencies and then the the short wavelength translates to low frequency Okay, you got, got it backwards. I've got that backwards. I was I was really yes. realizing that as I was saying that it's the opposite of what, what I was saying. Yes. But that's exactly how you can you can kind of make that switch in your brain to time domain to frequency domain. Well, and the other thing is, let's say you've got let's say you're looking at a CW carrier on a spectrum analyzer. Um, if you're looking at, at at one with a long wavelength, it's going to be over on the left side of the display. Right on the spectrum analyzer because it has a lower frequency. And then if for you long crank up for the long wavelengths of the carrier. Those waves get closer together, but our our vertical spike sticking up above the noise is just going to move. Gets going to move to the right. Higher and, and higher in frequencies as wavelengths get closer <laughs> and closer together. That's right. Those little ripples get really close together. All right. So here's a graphic I put together um, in Visio displaying the electromagnetic spectrum, and I show the typical cable TV network spectrum, RF spectrum in here, and the optical fiber spectrum that we use. So as you look at this this display, you can see that we start off way down here. There's the ELF, extra low frequency or extremely extremely low frequency, um, from 3 hertz to 30 hertz. And there's super low frequency, 30 hertz to 300 hertz and so on. Um, and this is wavelength in meters going across the top here. Um, and then we've got frequency in units of hertz. And you'll see we go from uh, 3 hertz all the way up. And by the way, it doesn't stop here. 300, I think that's ectahertz. And here we've got radio waves. And as we look at this, we can see where AM broadcast radio is, shortwave radio right here, TV, FM radio in about this range, microwave, satellite, radar in this frequency range. Infrared light is this big chunk of spectrum. Uh, visible light, fairly narrow chunk of the spectrum. I put a little rainbow right there. Yeah. And then ultraviolet light right up here. And then we get into X-rays. And gamma rays, considering on a, or continuing on its way, and I put dental X-ray in here. That's yeah, it has a frequency. Um, yep. That's the frequency. Now we know where it. our teeth get scanned. Well, um, <laughs> when my wife was undergoing some medical treatment um, for radiation treatment for breast cancer about five years ago, and hooray, she's coming up on her fifth anniversary here in another week or so. Good. Um, I wanted to know if she was getting radiation treatment just for a few days because thankfully they got all of it. Um, but she had five days of radiation treatment. So I said, ask the, ask him what the photon energy is. <laughs> and, and so she asked, asked the person running it and they tried to give her an answer. And, and uh, so they, she came back with a message and said, the nurses said you should come in and talk to the radiation <laughs> physicist. So I did. So we, I got a tour of the, the, the machine and it, it, it used, generates x-rays. So it's actually x-ray radiation that they, that they uh, zap people with for these kinds of treatments. So I got the photon energy and then I said, and he said, why do you want to know that? And I said, so I can convert it to frequency. <laughs> um, because physicists don't talk about frequency when they get up into, um, you know, x-rays and gamma rays, they typically talk about photon energy. So I wanted to okay. convert that back to frequency and wavelength and, and did. And you get up into the uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum that has gamma rays in it, you're talking about wavelengths that are that, that are the size of an atom. Right. And it's incre tiny, incredible. Tiny, tiny wavelengths. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, here's, here's the cable TV network RF spectrum, 5 megahertz to 1.2 gigahertz. It's right in here, and you can see what it overlaps. And I figured, well, why not put the optical fiber spectrum that we use in our single mode optical fiber length. So here it is, roughly 194 terahertz to 229 terahertz. So this is 1550 nanometers to 1310 nanometers. And notice here we talk about wavelength. We generally don't specify frequency when yeah. we're talking about the optical signals in our fiber. We talk about wavelength. And 1550 nanometer is lower frequency than 1310 nanometer. Remember? Yeah. And isn't it interesting wavelength? that we do that for optical, we, we, Everything's in wavelengths instead of frequencies. Why is yeah, that? We, Do you know? I have no idea why they picked that. <laughs> um, for as long as I've been involved in fiber optics, which goes back to the 80s, it's always the optics have always been. Yeah. Um, it's just the way it is. In, in wavelength, that's that's the that's uh, what the I guess the the terminology that they standardized upon, and it's been that way ever since. But being an RF guy, it's nice to be able to say, well, what frequency is a 1550 nanometers, and it's 194 terahertz. So it just helps to put that in perspective. All right, well, what about measuring RF? Now, in vi the visible light part of the electromagnetic spectrum, of course, we can see with our eyes, but can't see RF. But its presence 
and different parameters or characteristics such as its frequency, its wavelength, its amplitude, all those things can be detected and measured with specialized test equipment. And we use a bunch of that test equipment in the cable industry. Probably one of the most common is a signal level meter. We use that for measuring the amplitude of the signal. Um, oops, I misspelled frequency on frequency counters. I've got a typo. I missed that. <laughs> uh, power meters are typically, I'll, I'll have to pull that out of there, get that W out of there. Anyway, power meters to measure the RF power, that's more common in satellite and microwave communications. Frequency counters, you can use that to measure the frequency, um, sometimes, sometimes extremely accurately. And of course, spectrum analyzers. So we, as an industry, use all these um, in uh, different parts of our work, but probably most common spectrum analyzers and signal level meters. So a little bit more RF stuff. The RF signals propagate through free space or a vacuum at the speed of light and are made of photons. And then of course you might say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, stop Ron. I thought photons are what light's made out of. And yes, light is made of photons. And that's because light is a form of electromagnetic radiation. But radio waves are electromagnetic radiation, so are microwaves, infrared light, ultraviolet light, x-rays, gamma rays. They're all made of photons. Now, if you get into the world of physics, and I touched on this a little bit ago when I was talking about the wanting to know the photon energy of the, the radiation treatment my wife was getting, uh, the energy per photon is low at long wavelengths or uh, low frequencies, uh, such as RF, and it's high at short wavelengths, such as gamma rays. And um, if you think about getting a sunburn or a suntan, the, if, and we'll go back to the, this graphic here. From, whoops, didn't want that. I wanted stop that. Ah, I didn't want that either. <laughs> Let me get back to this one. Here we go. From current slide. I wanted to show this one. Um, photon energy. If you look at visible light, it's got a frequency or wavelength down in here in the rough, roughly, we'll call it 500 uh, nanometer to 700 nanometer range. And it's a little bit, a little bit wider than that. But look at ultraviolet light. It's in a higher frequency range, but it also has higher photon energy. And this is where we start getting into the into what's called ionizing radiation is somewhere in the ultraviolet um, light range because the wavelengths are so short, they can start to do damage to uh, tissue and cells and DNA and things. And that's why um, overexposure to the sun can cause things like skin cancer because we're dealing with very high photon energies. And, and here we can start getting into ionizing radiation. And that can be an issue because we when we when we think of um, radioactivity, uh, we, we're typically dealing with gamma rays, um, but we can also be dealing with other types of, of radioactivity. But we tend to think of gamma rays maybe more commonly uh, because of the, the photon energy is extremely high and it can do incredible amounts of damage to human tissue. Well, same thing. You get into the ultraviolet um, spectrum, you start getting into the area where you start seeing um, something called ionizing radiation. So let me get back up here. So anyway, so physicists um, talk about photon energy rather than frequency or wavelength. So that lets me share this really abstract point of view here. And that is that we can call RF, and I think some physicists do think of RF as really, really, really low frequency light, or we can also think of light as being just really, really, really high frequency RF. And that's just an abstract way to look at so it. So the duality of, of light um, and photons, whether or not they're a wavelength or a particle. Well, and, and they're both. I think it, to your point, it depends on what frequency they're at. Is, is that Actually, no. The in, the case, in the case of, of the duality um, of light, and in this case, we're talking about electromagnetic signals. It applies to RF as well as it does light. Um, they behave they behave like waves and they behave like particles. Yeah. And it depends on how you measure them. It depends on the measurements you use. But they're both correct, which is if you get into particle physics and, and quantum mechanics, and that gets really bizarre and it just makes your head go boom <laughs> trying to understand that stuff. But it's true. Uh, every test that's been done confirms that it's true. Yeah. So let's make things a bit more interesting. I've talked about RF energy and electromagnetic radiation propagating through the air, you know, as photons or wave like uh, with the wave like behavior. We can we can couple RF to a metallic conductor and that produces an electric current in the conductor. So think electrons and that electric current 
travels on and near the surface of the conductor. And that's a phenomenon called skin effect. And I've written about that in Broadband Library. So go to the Broadband Library website and dig up the article I wrote on skin effect and skin depth. And uh, it, that will help to provide a good understanding of, of what that's all about. Now at DC, we don't have the skin effect. It'll, it travels nope. through DC, the center. The, DC, it travels through the entire cross section of the conductor. So direct current uses the entire conductor. RF, uh, actually alternating current in general, but RF travels, the current travels on and near the surface. And the higher in frequency you go, the thinner the skin depth. So the, uh, the less of, the, of that metallic conductor is used for the RF. And that, the, so that's at very, very high frequencies. That's why coaxial cable has more attenuation at high frequencies than it does at low frequencies, because the effective cross section of the conductor at very high frequencies is much less than it is at lower frequencies. So you have effectively um, an increase in AC resistance or RF resistance at the higher frequencies because there's less conductor there. Um, anyway, that's that, that's a topic for another time. But it's also why we stress for you know technicians, anytime you're working with coax cable, be really careful not to scratch the outer conductor, not to run a, yeah. a, a razor around the outer conductor because that's where all the RF signals are running, right on the outside of that. Well, the outside, and then they penetrate it a little bit. Yeah. But the very, very high frequencies, uh, you if you score the conduct the center conductor, you can impact the cable's performance at really high frequencies. So that's important to note. And then, of course, our cable networks use frequencies from five megahertz to a gigahertz plus, um, one point eight gigahertz just around the corner. And coming soon, who knows? We could go much higher, conceivably. Anyway, and then. Uh, don't forget this, RF signals in conductors such as coaxial cable are high frequency or very high frequency or ultra high frequency alternating current. So you have the current traveling through the metallic conductors or actually on and near the surface of those conductors with an electromagnetic field propagating through the dielectric of the cable. Another topic for another. <laughs> so earlier I mentioned uh, connecting an oscilloscope up to, uh, to display a 64 qualm signal. Now remember on a spectrum analyzer, you see a six megahertz wide haystack. And this graphic on the right shows what a 64 qualm signal looks like on an oscilloscope. And you can see uh, variations in amplitude and phase in there because that's what qualm is. Quadrature amplitude modulation is a, com is, is a, is a combination of variations of amplitude and phase representing um, different uh, bits, if you will, or groups of bits that we call symbols. So we can use RF to convey information by varying one or more characteristics of the RF signal. We can vary its amplitude. We call that AM or amplitude modulation. We can vary its frequency. We call that FM or frequency modulation. And we can vary the phase of the signal. We call that phase modulation or PM or some combination. And in the case of, of QAM or quadrature amplitude modulation, we are varying the amplitude and the phase to represent groups of bits. So if you look on this display, you can see variations in amplitude. So there's yeah. the amplitude part, and you can see right there is a phase shift. So we're varying the phase. There's also a phase shift, a little bit of a phase shift here and here. And, and the phase shift is just the, you know, we're, we're changing direction of the sine wave. The sine wave is going in one direction, and then suddenly it changes the direction of the sine wave. That's what you're saying in that phase shift well, that you're seeing there. Well, sort of, but the topic of phase is a topic for another time. <laughs> it's, just, it's so complicated. <laughs> it, it, it is complicated, but it's part of alternating current and part of RF. So we can't see RF, we can't hear it. Uh, but we can see and hear the pictures and sound that it carries. An RF like can be, trans yeah, it can be transmitted by a conductor such as coax. Uh, it can be transmitted over the air, uh, for example, from a radio station's antenna to to your radio in your car. Uh, it can be transmitted through the vacuum of space, for example, communicating uh, with with distant spacecraft probes that are orbiting Jupiter or something. We can use RF to to cook food or heat a cup of coffee. Um, and you know, that makes it all pretty cool, I think, this thing we call RF. And um, I wrote a, an article, I think it was for Communications Technology several years ago about what is RF. And, and a lot of what I talked about today was used in that article. But uh, when I, I redid the article a little bit later, and some of my uh, 
data colleagues at Cisco said, yeah, this RF stuff's just magic. And yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it. Indeed, so, indeed. Questions? That was fantastic, Ron. Um, great, great intro to what is RF. I, I really hope our listeners like it. You know, folks, appreciate the questions in the chat room. Please drop comments um, in the comments section below. We'd love to hear your feedback on what you thought about this you know, this intro into what is RF. Um, hit the like button, subscribe. We'd love to hear your feedback on that. And if you want more on what is RF, definitely let us know. Um, Ron, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and um, to you know really make this under, help us understand this topic more. Even I, you know, I learned some more on this, and and I have a background on RF. So a lot, your you know, your depth and knowledge and enthusiasm in teaching this is just inspiring for all of us. So awesome, awesome. Well, thanks for the this. kind words. Um, I'm thinking that maybe next time we get together, I'm going to continue the discussion on RF and get into a few other um, bits and pieces of the the whole world of radio frequency. It's such a deep topic, and and I think you know it, it is something that. As an industry, we've because of all the software and things, we we've just not we don't focus on it. We don't uh, we don't engage on it a lot. So I think there's a lot we can tackle. Um, Melvin said he did miss a bit. Um, did you talk about harmonics? Um, so we didn't we cover did. harmonics in RF. I think that gets in you know intermodulation distortions. And that's stuff. another there's, that's another topic for another time. There's so much more we can get into. So I think I think yeah we can. We'll definitely uh, have another follow-up on this. So um, to our audience, thank you for tuning in and engaging with us. Um, please remember that understanding the fundamentals is key to mastering any field. Um, you know, so we talked about like ham radio and software-defined radios. So if you're interested in diving deeper, there's lots of opportunities to you know, practice some of this at home, study this, some of this at home, and, and learn more um, to, you know, just, just to build up your own tech toolkit for yourself. So lots of opportunities to continue learning. Um, so we do love hearing from you. Leave your thoughts and questions, suggestions, and comments below. They may help shape the content of our upcoming episodes. For those of you at the Piedmont SCTE chapter, I look forward to seeing you this Wednesday in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I'll be speaking on artificial intelligence and how it's helping cable technicians in the field. Um, drop in if you can and support the chapter. Love to see you there. Um, so, Cars, Melvin, thanks for the thumbs up. Really appreciate that, guys. Um, until next time, this is Brady Volp signing off alongside with the fantastic Ron Rannick. Keep exploring and uh, keep tuning in till the next episode. Thanks again. See you all. Cheers. <laughs>